So some of you are probably asking, what's coming up in 2026 on the Microwave One channel? Truthfully, I've got so many things that uh, have been left behind and so many projects that, you know, have arrived on the doorstep and you just put it away. And uh, it's, it's going to be a hodgepodge. But really, starting in 2026, I'd like to do some kind of a vacuum tube project because we've been doing a lot of solid state the past probably three months. I've been concentrating mostly on solid state projects. And of course, there's, a, there's always a sucking sound of people that say, hey, what about us tube guys? What about us uh, you know, vacuum tube guys? Why don't you uh, give us some more of that? So let me just show you what's, what's piled up here. So you can see down here, the Pixie, of course, is a very popular kit. Costs almost nothing, and it's fun to use on the air. But there are those that wish that this Pixie maybe had a little more power, and that some of the warts and uh, problems with it would be taken care of so that it acted more like a normal transceiver. So this Pixie Sprint idea, which started last year, kind of got put on hold. I was waiting for some support from my little harmonic to finally get this thing in production, but we're gonna have to circle back and handle that. And of course, you all know that my friend Wayne sent a lot of interesting stuff on regenerative receivers, and this is some of Wayne's stuff that arrived last year that I haven't even gotten to yet. So there's more solid state fun coming with regenerative receivers, some very advanced regenerative receiver concepts like automatic uh, regen control, you know, the old fashioned Armstrong and Hartley regens have been what this channel has concentrated on for the past 15 years. What's really happening with regens in the modern world? So we're gonna cover that. Does anybody recognize what this little box is? Yes, this is the famous Paraset transmitter receiver, a spy set. And we're going to be going through a complete build from collecting parts, metal fabrication, mounting parts, and as we wire a Paraset and take you through the entire process in a series of videos. This Paraset video series has been needed for a long time. There's so much information out on the internet and so many people supplying both real vintage parts as well as reproduction parts, solving problems with parts. It's time to build one and to show everybody what it really takes to put a Paraset together. You guys are really going to enjoy this show in 2026. Look at this thing. This was another donation to the channel last year that I never got to touch. This is a regenerative receiver, and it's all hand-built. And you'll notice that there's no real manufacturer, but this is a, a receiver that came from New York State in the Corning, New York area. It's a really interesting set. One of the tricks with receiver construction in the 1920s was to make kits. And the reason that you had a kit was to skirt the various patents. Basically, you would receive a kit of parts and usually you would go to your radio guy. Your radio guy in town would assemble the kit for you. You know, he was able to do all of the work in his shop and you would get the receiver. You'd have a custom built receiver without violating the patent restrictions. So these receivers are out there and some people uh, are saying, well, what's the manufacturer? Well, the manufacturer might be a transformer company and the transformer company might supply these kits in order to sell more transformers or it might be a vacuum tube company or it might be a, a particular coil type company that puts together the kit for you. But the idea was to give you a low cost receiver. Your radio guy would build this for you. And uh, because I can see engravings on the chassis. And also, if you look at the workmanship, you can see that this is very professional. But this is not a commercial radio. This is a kit radio from the 1920s. I received this uh, from a subscriber to the channel who happened to be a professor 
that is retired now, and this is something he picked up when he was in college at Cornell University in Elmira, New York. And even then, this, of course, was an antique, but it was a curiosity for him as a college student. And this was built into a piece of furniture. He was interested in the furniture, not the radio that was inside. There was a lot of interest in that cross the channel World War II communications coming up to uh, D-Day. That particular video that was uh, from last year was very interesting to people. I'd like to continue on that theme on maybe doing a communications on D-Day and D-Day plus one and uh, go through some of the military history. Also, you remember we were doing radio in the movies? A lot of people got a big kick out of that. And uh, I've collected a lot more uh, instances of seeing ham radios and military radios and historic radios used in movies. So we could have another one of those uh, movie-themed uh, videos. This is the General Electric BC-375 transmitter. This is the main transmitter in the B-17 and many of the other U.S. planes in World War II. This radio transmitter was winning the contract for GE simply because of its size and weight. A radio that can put out 100 watts with multiple band capability, weighing less than 100 pounds, easily won the competition for a flight-worthy transmitter on bombers. This transmitter was reproduced in the many thousands and this might be something that you've seen before, but always wondered how it worked. So we're going to be bringing this BC-375 back to life. Many of these had their final tubes stripped out by the audio community. It turns out that the VT-4-211 tube is quite popular for single-ended power amplifiers. And most of these are tubeless but I was able to get brand new tubes for this radio. Again, donated by a subscriber. An unopened package of VT4s and a VT52 for the microphone amplifier is ready to go for this BC375 transmitter. This is another big project for the channel for 2026. Of radios showed up that supposedly came off a sailboat and uh, this transceiver is the IC720. It's uh, one of those Japanese-built radios that has all the oddball circuits inside. Any radio that's been on a ship, especially a saltwater sailing vessel, is going to have issues. Is a transceiver like this interesting to you guys as far as trying to restore it, bring it back to life, or just see if it smokes? Oh, look at this gem. An FT-901DM. This is a, a part of the ham radio history. It is a late model hybrid radio. This guy also came out of a saltwater vessel. You can see it's pretty beat up. <laughs> is this worth looking at? Notice all these switches have been knocked off on the front. This is going to be really interesting to see if this is worth restoring or if it's just another parts radio. Another project I really have to get to soon is to rebuild my trap dipole. I'll be going through a complete trap dipole rebuild. I'll be installing that in the backyard. And we're talking about homemade traps. And these traps are going to have both strain relief and proper connections. Hermetic seal on the traps. I think you're going to like building these traps and making a trap dipole for 40 and 80 meters. Of course, radios like this old Halicrafters are showing up all the time on the channel. I pick these things up and restore them, so we'll be working on some of these classic shortwave listener radios from the 1950s and 60s. Here's another one by request. How about grinding crystals? I'll take you through how to grind crystals, how to measure them as you go, and how to do it the safe, modern way, where you just need to move something up a few kilohertz, to get on uh, maybe a new six meter AM net, or maybe you're trying to get back on 10 meters, but the crystals are a little bit off frequency. Let's do some crystal grinding. Anyway, that, that's a pretty good rundown of some of the things I know 
that the channel can do this year. And of course, there's always the unknown unknowns. I'm always interested in very simple circuits, you know, kids circuits, I call them. AI has been presenting a cavalcade of crazy looking circuits from the 40s, 50s, and 60s, usually using transistors you can't get anymore. It's a lot of fun to take those circuits and actually make them work with modern parts. And almost all of them don't work, which is great because that gives us something to do on the channel. You know, when you see a FM transmitter, you know, and or you see a, uh, a Q multiplier or some kind of a two transistor radio. Remember that reflexed circuit we did last year? That's interesting to a lot of people. So we can also do some of those very simple multifunction type circuits that uh, the internet seems to be flooded with right now. So here we are, 2026 in the Microwave One channel. I hope you stick with me.